so um, once again, my name is Dr. Um, Robert Sabo. I work for the United States e uh, Environmental Protection Agency with the Office of Research and Development. And um, I am presenting on behalf of many collaborators um, across federal agencies and uh, USDA, USGS, and a lot of academic partners. Um, so I just want to acknowledge them. And today we're going to be talking about the development of nitrogen and phosphorus inventories um, across the contiguous United States. Okay, so here's just an overview of today's presentation. I'll just give you a little introduction, a little background, and then we're going to uh, just go over the nitrogen and phosphorus inventories that the EPA has been developing. And hopefully, there'll be some neat insights into how the nitrogen and phosphorus cycle has changed. And uh, also, I'm going to be highlighting some next steps and how maybe you guys can help out um, in terms of improving our estimates of uh, livestock fluxes across the United States. As you're all aware, um, anthropogenic alterations of the phosphorus and nitrous cycle are pronounced across the United States. Um, we've increased the use of phosphorus and nitrogen fertilizers. Um, we're in, increasing the amount of uh, animals being produced and slaughtered across the United States. Um, provides a good, high quality, affordable food. But the inefficiency in the use of fertilizer and manure nutrients has uh, contributed to the increased non-point source losses to, to surface waters. Um, and there's another issue on top of this is that uh, these non-point source lo losses from agricultural areas are amplified by ongoing urbanization, where, of course, you have increased lawn fertilizer application, pet waste, degraded sewage infrastructure, and increased point source loads, contributing to uh, water quality de degradation. But let's take a look at water quality trends across the United States. So using empirical data um, from the USGS NACWA network, um, this map is showing red triangles, black triangles, and little circles. If you're seeing red triangles, uh, it's indicating that total phosphorus export, annual export, is increasing um, over from 2002 to 2012. Um, you can see those areas are concentrated in Kansas and parts of Virginia. Um, but there's also a lot of black triangles, and this is uh, pretty exciting news. And, and we're trying to figure out using these inventories what's driving these declines. So there's good spatial clustering. There's a lot of declines in TP export in Iowa and parts of the Chesapeake Bay. So if you were to go to a decision maker and you were to say, what's going on in these catchments? What's, what's, what's potentially driving these trends? How has the nitrogen and phosphorus fluxes changed through time? Um, that's a hard answer to uh, give um, across the United States. Okay. Um, and another element that's in, uh, motivating this uh, inventory is that um, despite widespread upgrades of wastewater treatment plants across the United States, um, farmers implementing agricultural best management practices, um, uh, detergent bans for dishwashers and uh, washing machines in certain states, and lawn fertilizer bans in certain states, uh, it seems like we're still not really moving the needle in terms of, of water quality improvement. So one thing that the EPA is trying to develop is spatially explicit terrestrial phosphorus and nitrogen input and output inventories to inform watershed restoration strategies. So the first objective, of course, is to illustrate how nitrogen phosphorus fluxes are varying across space and time. And this can be used to explore resource management options and assess and communicate progress in decreasing nutrient inputs and surplus to stakeholders. Um, in terms of uh, resource management options, um, once you, if you can identify the dominant source of nitrogen or phosphorus within a watershed, um, you can prioritize what BMPs are most appropriate. So if you're in an urbanized watershed and human, human waste is the predominant in, uh, in nitrogen, in, nitrogen or phosphorus input, of course, you might want to prioritize uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrades or upgrading um, septic systems in the area or actually just connecting people who are currently on septic to um, centralized wastewater treatment plants. Another goal is to identify the largest source of phosphorus and nitrogen inputs into watersheds, and just to put these fluxes into a quad quantitative context. So um, instead of discussing potential uh, dominant sources of nitrogen and phosphorus, this is actually a common platform for all stakeholders and decision makers to come together and work with hard data um, to try to make the best decisions possible. 
and hopefully to tailor specific nutrient management strategies to achieve water quality goals. And the third and final uh, point and objective of this inventory is to use this data set out actually to calibrate statistical models to infer drivers of soil, air, and water quality change across space and time. Okay. So what's in this inventory? So we assembled these contiguous United, uh, uh, these inventories across the contiguous United States for 2002, 2007, 2012, centered on the agri agricultural census. And we quantified total nitrogen and phosphorus inputs. And some examples of inputs include human waste, livestock waste, which can also be called livestock manure or livestock nutrients, um, agricultural fertilizer, urban fertilizer, atmospheric deposition, pesticide and herbicides. We also estimated total non-hydrologic outputs, and these include fluxes like crop removal and livestock. And then there's various metrics we calculate, like terrestrial surplus, agricultural nutrient use efficiency, et cetera. We also estimate point source loads for 2007 and 2012 using the Hypoxia Task Force point source loading tool. So any wastewater treatment plant or industrial complex that has a NIPTES permit, uh, we have estimates of how much nitrogen phosphorus is being ex uh, lo loaded into local streams. And also we calculate legacy phosphorus um, in agricultural soils um, based on livestock and fertilizer inputs. So there's a lot of data. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff to work with. Okay, so that was a lot of text. How about we just look at a simple conceptual diagram of what these inventories look like. So this is for the nitrogen inventory, and you can imagine whether it's a state, county, watershed, you can imagine whatever polygon you want to plop on top of the United States. That area has an inherent demand for phosphorus or ni for nitrogen uh, based on existing livestock and human populations. And of course, the nitrogen phosphorus is processed through the organisms and um, deposited as waste. Um, and there's other inputs of nitrogen, of nitrogen to the watershed as well, um, including fertilizers, atmospheric deposition, also natural forms of nitrogen inputs, like, uh, including biological end fixation. You can think like black locust trees. Um, also, there's uh, estimates from geologic rock weathering. And, and then these yellow arrows account for nitrogen out, uh, non-hydrologic outputs. Like, so how much nitrogen in the field is removed following crop harvest, or how much nitrogen is emitted into the atmosphere um, due to ammonia emissions, NOx emissions, et cetera. We also have uh, emission estimates from fossil fuel combustion and a couple other influxes as well. Okay. Um, I don't want to go into detail of how we estimate all these fluxes, uh, but I, I found it appropriate to at least provide um, some background how we estimate livestock fluxes. So um, we used end of year uh, livestock poultry population estimates from the Ag Census, and we simply multiply it by livestock poultry specific constant. So the um, poultry has a specific um, nitrogen demand for the year, and we just simply uh, multiply that nitrogen demand by the end of year um, poultry population. Um, this is a simple, straightforward model where you can easily track how fluxes are changing through time. Um, but it's worth acknowledging that there's other generally simple models available, including um, dynamic models and using animal units rather than end of year livestock populations. Um, and overall, these different empirical models give you generally this uh, approximately the same numbers through time. But one thing that's kind of intriguing, and one thing I'm hoping to get feedback from you all, is that if you stick with these models, um, the trends are beginning to diverge. So one simple model, uh, the static livestock model that we use, is indicating that nitrogen phosphorus inputs are increasing uh, from 2002 to 2012. But if you use a uh, animal unit li um, population model um, because cow populations have decreased through time. Uh, it's actually indicating that nitrogen and phosphorus waste um, through livestock is actually going, is remaining constant or starting to slightly go down. So um, some feedback on these constants and what models would be most effective would be very helpful. Okay. So let's jump into the results. So first we're gonna jump start from a national perspective. 
So one big takeaway from a national perspective is that nitrogen inputs remain stable. So if you look at this last row, um, the units are in teragrams, this is a very big number. Uh, they range between 34 and 35 teragrams over three inventories. But this stability sort of masks uh, different components of the inventory changing through time. So when you look at agricultural fertilizer from 2002 to 2012, we have about a two teragram increase in nitrogen fertilizer use for agricultural areas. So where did nitrogen inputs decline? What um, component of the inventory? And the decline mainly came from the decline in total atmospheric end deposition by about 1.4 teragrams right here in the fourth row. So around 2002 is around seven teragrams. And then in 2012 is around five and a half teragrams of nitrogen. And one question might be asking is uh, what could be driving that decline in deposition? And it's mainly due to decrease in nitrous oxide emissions um, due to the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. So this is the last table we're really going to be looking at and zooming in on today from a national perspective. But now let's get into the more exciting maps that show the magnitude of flux and the change through time. Okay. So from the national perspective, the nitrogen inventory is pretty stable. But when you actually zoom in, uh, you can see that there's actually quite a bit of things going on at the regional level. So at the, on the left graphic is total atmospheric end deposition rates um, normalized uh, by the Huckate area, the watershed area. And on the right is the difference between 2012 and 2002 um, in atmospheric deposition. So if you're seeing green, that means it's gone down. If you're seeing gray, hasn't changed much. If you're seeing orange and red, means it's uh, going up. So for atmospheric deposition, no areas of the country showed increased rates of atmospheric deposition from 2002 to 2012. But you see large swaths of the eastern United States experienced a decrease in atmospheric deposition of 2.5 to up to 16 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, um, which is great news for water quality. Um, um, some exceptions include Maine, uh, which had pretty low atmospheric deposition rates to begin with, and southeast North Carolina, where there's a large about amount of swine production and other livestock types, where ammonia emissions have actually increased over the period of record. Okay. So let's look at another component of the inventory. So same setup. So on the left shows you the rate of agricultural fertilizer application. And as you can imagine, it's highest in the, um, the cereal crop production regions of the country. Um, and uh, upwards of a hundred, greater than 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare for the watershed area. And what I find most intriguing though is this uh, temporal aspect. And you can see that in the upper Great Plains um, and, and much of the heartland of the United States, uh, agricultural fertilizer application rates increased 10 to sometimes up to like 60 to 70 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. So, what could be driving this increase in nitrogen inputs? Uh, uh, in 2007, uh, there was a renewable fuel standard that was passed that could have drove an increase in crop, uh, uh, increased demand for corn. Um, there's also uh, increased demand for pork products from the international markets. So there's a lot of forces at play. And what's advantageous about these inventories is that you can start exploring the implications of these resource um, or of these um, of these policy decisions. Okay. So let's just look at a broad brush view of changes in the nitrogen phosphorus inventory across the United States. So no total nitrogen inputs were highest in the upper Midwest, as I said before, but because of a decline in atmospheric deposition, total the change in total inputs actually declined throughout much of the eastern United States. So this is when you're including human waste and livestock waste as well. But in the upper Midwest and up, even up into the Dakotas, uh, um, due to increased fertilizer inputs primarily, um, total nitrogen inputs increased. Um, if you look at graphics C and D, total non-hydrologic outputs include emissions and crop removal, and crop removal is the biggest driver. And what's kind of intriguing is when you look at the change in total non-hydrologic outputs. If you remember, if everyone sees my mouse, uh, in Ohio, Illinois, and Iowa, um, 
fertilizer inputs increased 10 to 60 or 70 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare over from 2002 to 2012. But for some reason, we had a big decline in crop removal. And you might be scratching your head, like usually if you increase your inputs, you're going to increase your outputs in crop removal and crop yields. But in this, year, uh, in this year, in 2012, crop yields were depressed by 30% due to a historic drought that occurred in 2012. So uh, while our high input and high output strategies for crop, um, for crop cultivation have actually increased NUE over time, um, year-to-year variation in terms of climate can uh, lead to big declines in crop removal. And then leads to our last graphic, also the amount of nitrogen left behind in the field. So um, you see these terrestrial surpluses. So essentially, this is the amount of nitrogen that's left over um, after you account for the inputs and the outputs. And you can see in much of the upper Midwest, uh, nitrogen surpluses increased. So you had an increase in fertilizer inputs, and then you had a decrease in uh, crop removal rates, which is uh, not a good combination if you're trying to decrease surplus nitrogen on the landscape. Um, that's not all bad news. Throughout the eastern United States and much of California, we had a decrease in surplus over the period of record. Okay. So here's just a quick conceptual diagram of the phosphorus inventory. It's uh, very similar to that of the nitrogen inventory. It's a lot simpler, though, because you don't have the gaseous forms. Um, as I said before, you have a nitrogen and phosphorus demand based on existing human and livestock populations. Um, but there's a unique piece for the phosphorus is that uh, you also have non-human food demand, which because phosphorus is a common component in laundry and dishwasher detergents. Um, back in the 70s, pretty much in all states throughout the United States banned the use of phosphorus in laundry detergents, and that was implemented through the 80s and 90s. Um, and, but dishwasher detergents are still a large component of phosphorus into the uh, into urbanist systems. Um, inputs include livestock waste, uh, human waste, urban fertilizer, atmospheric deposition, as well as pesticides and herbicides. Um, there was a recent paper in uh, Frontiers in Ecology that uh, suggested that uh, glyphosate might be a large source of phosphorus to the landscape. So we actually want to put that number to a quantitative context and actually compare it to what say what fertilizer rates actually are to get a better handle of what the actual implication, phosphorus implication is. Um, total non-hydrologic outputs, of course, includes livestock production and crop removal. And we also quantified point source loads for this inventory. Okay. So here's another neat map. This is the largest uh, phosphorus input in 2002 and 2012. Um, if you're in what thing, one thing you're going to notice, you're going to see a lot of green and a lot of brown. And if you're seeing green, that means farm fertilizer is the largest source of phosphorus into that watershed, while in brown is uh, livestock waste, or also known as livestock nutrients or livestock manure, um, uh, is a lot, is actually covers a, a large amount of the United States. And this is actually useful for decision makers in terms of a um, and th these maps in terms of uh, in, for federal decision makers in terms of being able to prioritize uh, what uh, management strategies are going to be needed to help local stakeholders achieve their water quality goals. Okay, so I'm going to show you some more of these maps where we're on the left, we're going to show the intensity of uh, inputs and on the right, it's going to be the change in uh, change in inputs through time. So in the left, farm fertilizer application for phosphorus uh, was highest in the cereal crop producing regions of the country, but also in eastern North Carolina, where there's actually quite a bit of livestock production going on, um, and in, of course, parts of the Great Valley in California. One thing that was pretty intriguing is that um, unlike nitrogen fertilizer for farms, phosphorus farm fertilizer decreased by about, a ter um, uh, I believe, about a half to a one teragram over the period of record. Um, and this was due to big decreases in phosphorus fertilizer use in California and throughout the eastern United States, especially in the Chesapeake Bay region um, um, as, uh, with the, with, yeah, after the Chesapeake Bay executive order. And similar to uh, the nitrogen inventory, 
Uh, you've seen large increases in phosphorus, farm, uh, farm phosphorus fertilizer inputs. But there's one glaring exception, and this is pretty intriguing. Illinois uh, fertilizer use did not increase over the period of record. And this coincides nicely with uh, Illinois' recent uh, nutrient reduction strategies that they implemented in the mid 2000s. So um, I'm not, uh, we can't say definitively that's the, co the driver of decreased phosphorus use, um, but it's uh, kind of intriguing that uh, nitrogen use increased in Illinois, but phosphorus uh, remained the same or actually went down. Um, here's the livestock excretion for phosphorus. And as you can imagine, parts of Wisconsin and uh, northern Iowa and southern Minnesota have high livestock excretion rates. And this is um, um, and also in the fertile, what's called the fertile crescent of the Chesapeake Bay, the Shenandoah Valley up into Wisconsin, into the uh, peninsula of Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware, which is called the Delmarva Peninsula in southeast North Carolina. So you have high inputs of livestock waste into these areas, which um, can be a valuable source of plant nutrients. Um, and what's kind of intriguing, though, is the changes in the livestock poultry inventories across the United States led to pretty dramatic changes in um, waste flux rates uh, over from 2002 to 2012. So here in Wisconsin, you're seeing a decline in the dairy herd. Um, in the Shenandoahs, you see a decline in turkey and chickens. Uh, but you see an increase in chicken cultivation in the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, increased swine production in southeast North Carolina is driving the increase in waste inputs there. So it's pretty intriguing how um, just the change in uh, proportion of livestock populations is uh, shifting uh, phosphorus, phosphorus inputs due to the livestock industry. Okay. Um, this crop removal, once again, it's pretty much the same exact story from the nitrogen inventory. You have high crop removal rates in the cereal crop producing regions of the country, and then that drought just depressed crop yields, which, of course, is going to contribute to an increased surplus across the United States. Okay. Now I want to talk about, this is a very important map that we're working on and we're trying to refine the estimate a little bit more, is, um, is it's approximating legacy phosphorus um, in soil. So essentially the phosphorus that has accumulated in agricultural lands um, over the past 60 to 70 years. Um, this value is important because when we're trying to set water quality restoration goals and uh, create appropriate expectations for uh, timelines for improvement. It'll be helpful for decision makers and for local stakeholders to have an idea how much phosphorus is in the soil and vulnerable to being lost uh, to surface water, even if you cease um, phosphorus inputs. Um, so the graphic on the left is the summed input of livestock waste and farm fertilizer from 1945 to 2001. And you can see the hot spots are, of course, in the cereal crop producing regions of the country, uh, Central Valley of California, um, the Fertile Crescent of the Chesapeake Bay in Southeast North Carolina. So you have these high input rates. But we also wanted to account for maybe crop removal rates over the period of record. So this is called the legacy phosphorus inputs or legacy phosphorus surplus. So we have the summed inputs of nitrogen, or I'm sorry, summed inputs from fertilizer and livestock waste. But what if you account for crop removal over that period of record? You can actually see the map changes quite a bit. So you have this dark brown area in the upper Midwest, you had high inputs, but you also had high removal rates. So, uh, so the the phosphorus pools range from 100 to 200 kilograms of phosphorus per, per hectare. But in the uh, livestock producing regions of the eastern United States and southeast North Carolina and the um, Fertile Crescent of the Chesapeake Bay, you have pretty high phosphorus legacy pools of greater than 600 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare. So we pushed this uh, calculation a little further and we, we just did a, a quick hypotheticals. And we said, what if you turned off all phosphorus inputs from livestock waste 
and from fertilizer. And you relied on the mean crop removal rate from 2002 to 2012. How long would it take to mine down that legacy phosphorus pool? And this is actually quite heartening for parts of the Mississippi. Um, so if you're seeing yellow to a light green, that means it would take like one to 30 years to mine down that pool of phosphorus. If you're seeing dark blue, it's going to take a long time. So in the upper Midwest, because crop removal rates are already so high, um, it would only take 10 to 50 years to mine down that pool. Um, and this actually is consistent with some of the water quality improvements we're seeing in parts of Iowa and Illinois uh, for phosphorus. Is that if you manage phosphorus right, you're taking advantage of that livestock manure and you're um, using phosphorus uh, mineral fertilizer well, um, you can have a water quality response. And these legacy pea pools might not be as much of an issue. However, in part, agriculture, other agricultural parts of the country, like the Delmarva Peninsula in Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware, you have very high pools. Crop removal rates are not that high. Uh, you just have a large source of livestock waste. Um, it's going to take uh, millennia, uh, it would take centuries to millennia to actually mine down those current pools. So that's going to mean uh, you have to reset your management options and see what else you can consider. Okay. Other parts of the country say a big part of the Piedmont of the southeast United States and of course these desert southwest areas. Um, of course that might seem problematic at first, but you have to remember that these areas, agricultural land use is very low and, um, and a lot of that agricultural land that was cultivated, especially in the Piedmont, is now forested in the southeastern United States. So that phosphorus might not be necessarily vulnerable to being as lost. So. Here's our project status. So we've developed these inventories for 2002, 2007, and 2012. And we have identified and compiled existing databases of nitrogen and phosphorus inputs and outputs across the United States. We've calculated surplus and other metrics. So other metrics include nitrogen use efficiency and phosphorus use efficiency on croplands. Um, in terms of the status, uh, the databases for both inventories is complete. The nitrogen manuscript has been accepted for publication in Journal of Geophysical Research, Biogeoscience, and our phosphorus manuscript is currently in STICS, which is simply the EPA clearance house, um, policy clearance house. So the next steps, and this is where I'm hoping you all can contribute, is um, from a GIS, GIS perspective, we'll be downscaling these inventories down to the NLCD level essentially spatially allocating nitrogen and phosphorus flux to appropriate land uses so as you can imagine uh, farm fertilizer will be applied to farmland within the within a watershed and that we're also going to be extending these inventories to 1987 and updating it up to 2017. and uh, another important piece of the puzzle is that we're going to be relating these inventories to water quality trends um, this is important because we can actually get an estimate how responsive uh, watersheds will be to changes in nitrogen or phosphorus inputs or surpluses. So um, you can imagine in parts of the coastal plain, uh, the legacy phosphorus pool might be so high, if you change the input or the surplus, uh, this watershed might not be extremely sensitive in terms of a water quality response. So you might need to have other appropriate interventions come in. And also we're developing communication tools to help uh, local stakeholders and decision makers um, uh, communicate progress and the status of their nitrogen phosphorus cycle in their backyard. So in terms of what we can um, offer and, and, the next, and now offer in the next few years. So immediately, if you're interested in any of these databases or this inventory, uh, I'd be happy to point you in the right direction where you can download these databases, or if you want to just work with this Huck 8 da um, data, um, we, I'd be happy to share. Uh, the, right currently, uh, the nitrogen inventory is now freely available now that it's been published, and hopefully the phosphorus inventory Huck 8 scale will be available soon after uh, peer review. Um, I can also, if you guys are interested in discussing these data sets more, I can provide recommendations for the use of the source databases that made these inventories. So in the next few years, I've already highlighted this in the previous slide, but we're going to be updating these inventories. So they cover the 1987 to 2017 period, and we're going to allocate these based on land use. 
And also, um, we want to improve current way methodologies of how we're estimating, say, livestock waste and livestock demand and livestock production. Um, so um, I'd be happy in all years uh, if you want to contribute to improving the livestock inventory piece. Um, I appreciate some ideas and tips. So I appreciate everyone's time. And uh, if you have any questions, my contact information is on this slide. And uh, yes, have a great day. And thank you for having me.